Hello? Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. That's, uh, this is my second year in Omaha. There's no hummus this time. Uh, I was looking for it. Actually, just got back, actually, this Monday from Yale University to support Ayan Hirsi Ali. Uh, <laughs> right, so I can, to free speech, because free speech is in danger here in America, and we need to defend it. It's very unfortunate, I would say, that the Yale atheist group in, in, in university sided with the Muslim Student Association against Ayan Hirsi Ali right to speech, because she's a critic of Islam, and that's somehow going to make people uncomfortable. Who cares if she's going to make people uncomfortable? Today's speech is actually uh, about how to defeat ISIS. It's not about the Egyptian god, I love her, but I'm talking about the new terrorist group that's showing up recently, well, it's not recently, it's been a year so far, in uh, Syria and Iraq. ISIS is no longer uh, just a terrorist group, it's already a state uh, with, a, with a caliph, a leader, called Abu Amr al-Baghdadi. Actually, yesterday at the dinner, they were uh, putting name tags for nicknames. I put Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, some people notice who this guy is, so he's now famous. Um, and I would like to touch on how did that happen and how to successfully counter it. Um, just a brief introduction about the Islamic State. They're considered the extremists by Al-Qaeda. So imagine how terrible you must be uh, to the way that Al-Qaeda considers you an extreme. Um, uh, the main difference between the two, two, the, uh, two of these uh, terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, is pretty much a conflict of vision. It's not a bit pretty much about ideology. Al-Qaeda is a promising establishment of an Islamic State in the future, while ISIS leadership, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who has a PhD in Islamic studies, by the way. So that sometimes whenever people say, well, when it comes to Ayan Hirsi Ali event, they said, oh, and Hirsi Ali doesn't have a credential. So I emailed Yale and told them, why don't you invite Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi? He has some <laughs> credentials to talk about the subject. Uh, and that went viral, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so, so the conditions uh, for this main group to exist were two, actually. The civil war in Syria, which has been going on for four years, and also in Iraq, which existed pretty much since the blowing up of Al-Askari Mosque in Samarra. Uh, northern Baghdad and the rise up of the civil war. I was actually one of these people who wasn't at all surprised that something that, like this was, was going to happen. I mean, I get, started getting calls about, oh, tell us about the shocking news about ISIS. I was like, I'm not surprised. This was going to happen. And everybody who deals with and works in foreign policy knows that this thing was going to happen anyway. So since the United States pulled off their troops back in 2012, uh, former Prime Minister al-Maliki, applied sectarian laws that discriminate against the Sunni minority in Iraq. Um, Al-Maliki, who is heavily Iranian-influenced, uh, was so happy that the United States was, would pull off their troops without any exit strategy so he can have it all his way. Um, and the Sunni minority have been used uh, that they are in power since the start of Iraq. So it really doesn't take much to piss them off. And um, while Al-Maliki applies sectarian laws and they're already pissed off, and we get ISIS. Um, and the Iraq and Syria are actually the opposite of each other in terms of majority, uh, majority minority dynamics. Iraq is a Shia majority, Sunni minority, while Syria is a Sunni majority, Shia minority, even though Al Alawites sometimes are not really considered Shia by some Shia scholars. I mean, the idea of actually true Muslim is always confused. Uh, because some Sunnis consider Shias not true Muslims and some Sunnis consider Ahmadiyya not true Muslims. So it's really very confusing. Um, the battle of ISIS is actually a regional one because, as well as a global one. Uh, the Syrian Alawite government, uh, Bashar al-Assad, is in alliance with two main uh, groups, which is Hezbollah in southern Lebanon and Iran, the Islamic Republic. While ISIS is a Sunni militia mostly supported by Saudi Arabia and Qatar, um, now it's actually their self-financed terrorist organization, which makes it kind of much more difficult to combat. Uh, many of their weapons, some of them actually got smuggled through Turkey to some extent as a result of U.S. support to the liberal fighters, Free Syrian Army. Um, and there's actually an article published in the New York Times just in the past two weeks 
about in Qatar, they have open fundraising for ISIS. So who wants to donate? Uh, go to PayPal and make a donation. Um, and now it's actually the United States is making a similar mistake of uh, supporting people that we don't really know what they actually believe in. Um, if, if the United States is, in my opinion, if it's going to support and help the Free Syrian Army and the Free Syrian um, rebels, they have to make sure that they follow international laws. They're, they're not going to be the same moderates we supported in Iraq, thinking that they were moderates and eventually it backfired. Um, uh, uh, Farid Zakaria uh, published a very great article on the local newspaper at the Washington Post. I don't know if you're familiar with his show, GPS, on CNN. It's a, it's a very great one. Uh, called the, the article called The Fantasy of Middle Eastern Moderates. Um, he was talking about Senator Clinton, uh, or probably the potential candidate for Democratic Party in 2016, uh, about the new conventional wisdom in Washington, D.C., about uh, if we supported the moderates, we have probably prevented the rise of the Islamic State. Um, and here are what the facts are. Um, the United States has provided massive and sustained aid to the moderates in the region. Uh, the Islamic State, that's, I'm quoting Zakaria here, uh, the Islamic State known as Islamic State as Iraq and Syria was created in Iraq, grew out of country's internal dynamics over the past decades. The United States helped organize Iraq moderates, quote unquote, uh, the Shia dominated country, giving them billions of aid in dollars and training their army. But it turned out that the moderates were in that moderate as they became authoritarian, authoritarian and sectarian after the United States pulled off, Sunni, move, Sunni opposition movements grew and jihadi opposition groups such as ISIS gained tact and active support. Um, for decades uh, since actually uh, even the Cold War has been always following this policy of like, well, we should support the moderates and th because the extremists are just a fringe minority and, uh, and the problem is there is actually very few of them. Uh, in this, especially in this conflict. Thomas Friedman in the New York Times published an article about two weeks ago in which he raised five questions when it comes to aiming the moderate troubles. He said, can somebody please name five of them? Uh, because we actually hear about there, there has to be moderates and they represent the majority and the minority are just a bunch of extremists. There isn't actually organized moderates. And can somebody explain, that's his second question, is why Israel, which is a, second, a country just second uh, ne next door to Syria has better intelligence in Syria than anyone else C did not help the secular and moderate Syrian rebels. Um, and how could the good Syrian rebels have triumphed in Syria when the main funders are Saudi Arabia and Qatar, which are Sunni fundamentalist monarchies that oppose the very sort of democratic pluralistic politics in their own countries that the decent Syrian rebels aspire to build. Um, and he said that I don't want troops in Syria more than anyone else but I have no respect for the argument that arming the quote-unquote pro-democracy rebels would have gotten this job done. Yes, there has been a price for Obama's inaction, but there's also a price for effective action, and the critics have to be honest about it. Um, I mean, I cannot really imagine how difficult it is to be Obama right now, um, because we have to deal, because we are dealing with very internal struggle in the region, so if you're going to support the Syrian, the, if you support, you have to make sure that you're not supporting your enemies by supporting, if you're going to side against ISIS, you're helping Assad and Iran and Hezbollah, and if you fight against them, you're helping ISIS. Actually, I have a new definition for what is actually a radical Muslim and a, and a, and a, a moderate Muslim. Uh, the radical Muslims are actually the one who believe in liberal democracy and secular values, while the mainstream is actually the one that hold values that most liberals in this room disagree about. So I think we should support the radical Muslims, not the moderate Muslims. Um, thank you. No other example actually I can give than the Iraqi opposition uh, to Saddam Hussein back in 2003, and they were mostly located in Washington and London. And, uh, and they were, I mean, Saddam Hussein was not a bad guy. He was a monster. Uh, I mean, calling him a bad guy is probably a compliment. Um, but many of his opponents in, in prior to 2003 who were up, trying to lobby for the war were not actually the liberal democrats. Many of, most of them were Al-Maliki-like people who were opposing him for merely sectarian purposes. So there's actually a term um, from Frederick Roosevelt. It was about the, they were asking him, why do you support the Nicaraguan dictator? And he said, well, he could be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. 
And uh, this is actually what pretty much uh, rolls out the dynamics of politics in, in Iraq and, and in Syria, in which most of the elections have proven over and over again that the Shias are going to fight for Shia regardless if the Sunni or the secular person was qualified and educated and everything. I'm not saying in any sense that there are no moderate Muslims or liberal Muslims, but they, are, they don't represent the majority as we think they, they do. I do think that ISIS does not speak for the majority of Muslims, but they're also not a minority group. We have always been stuck in the because we've always been stuck in the mentality that the extremists are a fringe minority and like they're one percent and the rest is ninety nine percent who are peace loving. Um, that's not to say that the majority of Muslims. I have to make that clear that extremists. But to say that extremists are a minority is a fallacy and a delusion, which I'm going to debate about today, uh, just to keep you excited. A, rep a report on Reuters uh, published about a year ago uh, about the countries that atheists and other religious skeptics ca will be executed in. And these countries are Afghanistan, Malaysia, Maldives, Mauritania, Nigeria, Pakistan, which has a nuclear weapons, by the way, um, Iran, which is trying to build the nuclear weapons, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Sudan, UAE, and Yemen. Can someone tell me what do these countries have in common? Somebody got it right. Yes, they're all Islamic Sharia law countries.